So if Professor Lane and Professor Shostak will join me on stage, uh, we're going to have our discussion now. And I ask you, uh, for all those that have questions, if you, we have two microphones down by the stage. And if you just come up to the microphone, you can wait in line if there's several of you, and we'll take your questions, OK? Um, actually, I might stay here because I can see you better. <laughs> So until somebody uh, comes up, I actually have quite a few questions myself. I want to thank you all, first of all, for providing this wonderful morning session. And uh, we've had the opportunity to travel from our earliest instances of life to a critical point in evolution towards the early days of humankind. At the same time, contemplating humankind's role amidst the interconnected realms which surround us. So I'll try to, um, I just want to first ask Don Johansson quickly, what was uh, the most unusual aspect of finding Lucy? We didn't even know she was missing. <laughs> <laughs> no. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to set you up that way. It's all right. But <laughs> okay, um, if I could start with you, sir. Question for, Question for um, Professor Schustock. Um, if you go back to the 1950s, there was a fellow by the name of Miller who convinced his um, thesis advisor to allow him to zap the primordial atmosphere of the Earth, methane and ammonia, with lightning or discharge, electrical discharge. And we know today that he actually generated all 20 amino acids. Uh, is this no longer considered uh, a possible pathway to the beginning of life, uh, the primordial soup that was created in this fashion? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think the, the change in our thinking has been uh, that in the early chemistry that Stanley Miller did, you actually generate not just the 20 amino acids of biology, but thousands, tens, probably hundreds of thousands of different compounds. And the ones that we need to make biology are just in trace amounts, parts per million, parts per billion. So the more modern thinking has evolved to consider ways that you can focus the chemistry and channel reactivity to make a subset of the molecules that are the ones that are useful for building biology. That's where the real progress has been. Thank you. Thank you. You're next. Yeah. I have a question for Mr. Johansson. Um, well, how do you think the globalization will affect uh, the human evolution in the future? I, c I didn't hear the question. Well, how will globalization affect human evolution in the future, uh, assuming that we continue in the future? Um, certainly, there, we see already that there are genes traveling all the time all over the planet, and we are all one single species today. So that I think that there may be changes in population frequencies of genes that affect various parts of our, our bodies that include things like skin color and abilities and so forth and so on. It'll be sort of a homogenizing sort of uh, effect, uh, which brings up the question of uh, where will we go as a species? Uh, will there be drastic differences? Will we speciate? Will we become a different species? I think as long as you have genes flowing across, and you don't have to have very many, as uh, Ehrlich and Rabin have uh, in their seminal article uh, wrote, but you have to have genes moving. And we do that today much more often than we did, say, 10,000 or 50,000 years ago. Um, but if we are successful, in undertaking long-term uh, trips into space uh, with maybe never even returning to the planet, certainly natural selection on that ship may lead to a very different kind of species that actually left the planet. Uh, because one of the key things for speciation is is to have a, a block that prevents genes from being exchanged. And obviously, if we have a ship that goes out and it's out there for 50,000, 100,000 years, 
uh, it's going to be isolated under very different conditions. And probably natural selection will lead them in a very different way. And I, I don't think it's naturally really science fiction, but it's, it's the way evolution works. And if they were able to return after another 100,000 years, they might not be a very different species than the one they left on the planet. Okay. Does anyone else want to make a comment on that? Or? Yeah. Good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. To add to that. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Lane. Um, how do you track the methane levels in the atmosphere? Do you have any special instruments, or how do you track it? How do you detect methane levels in the atmosphere? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's something that's been done. I mentioned Mars, um, and there's been some controversy. Um, so you, you can measure it relatively simple by mass spectroscopy, uh, but it's the detection limits. And uh, this is not something that I follow too closely, but my understanding is that the landers have failed to detect uh, methane relatively recently, whereas a few years ago, there were certain times in the season where in the upper atmosphere of Mars it was possible to detect whiffs of methane, you might say. Uh, so it's not clear at the moment, were they, is it different detection limits between the different machines, because it's difficult to, to land a payload of, uh, of heavy machines on the surface of Mars, it's easier to get something into orbit around Mars. Um, is it the seasonality? Uh, was it a mistake in the instrument in the first place? I think most people would say it was probably genuinely detected, it's just seasonal and it doesn't happen all the time, but it's very low levels. But it, in terms of technically, I mean, the instruments are fairly standard instruments for detecting it. Thank, Thank you. you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Lane, mainly. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, you took up the point with uh, potential life on other planets. So my question is, uh, if we would find life on another planet, would it be, how would we be able to recognize it? Or could it maybe be too different uh, than the life we have on this planet to recognize? Yeah, that's a, a very interesting and difficult question. And uh, I'm sure Professor Shostak will have things to say about that as well. I mean, there's a lot of people thinking about this now because we are trying to detect life on other planets. And there are serious plans to send um, spacecraft to Enceladus and you know what should you look if you're looking through the plumes of Enceladus what should we be looking for that would be a sign of, of life and you, you know you could say oh DNA or RNA but that assumes that it would be DNA or RNA based on another planet and it's possible there would have to be a hereditary molecule and there are limits over the structure of what those molecules could be but it would be astonishing if it was exactly the same and certainly if the code was the same if, if it was then you would probably assume that there was some contamination. Um, same for a lot of the building blocks of life. You could, you know, if you detected ATP, you would be fairly certain that <laughs> there was either life there or there was contamination, but it was unlikely. I wouldn't go looking for ATP. Um, I think what I would look for would be chirality, which is to say life will choose between a right-handed or a left-handed form of a molecule. And I think enzymes necessarily have to do that because enzymes are hand-in-glove type mechanisms and it, will, it must select one or the other. And so as soon as you have life, you will have that form of selection. There are other mechanisms of doing it, but rarely to give you almost 100% of one type and uh, not, almost nothing of the other. That assumes enzymes, but I think that's not unreasonable. It assumes carbon chemistry. That's, again, not unreasonable. So I think that's broadly diagnostic of life of the carbon-based type that we already know. And there'll be good arguments to think that you know, carbon is ubiquitous and it's very good at that kind of complex chemistry. So to say carbon-based is, I think most people would agree, there's a good chance that if we find life, there's a good chance it would be carbon-based, in which case I think chirality is about the most general uh, thing I would look for. Jack, do you have views on that? Yeah, I think li life uh, anywhere that we find it is, is going to be homochiral. It's going to be either all right or left-handed. Um, you know, that's 50-50. It doesn't necessarily tell you all that much. There's a really interesting uh, kind of debate and a lot of exploration going on now in terms of the uh, chemistry leading to the molecules of heredity. And the question is, uh, if that chemistry evolves uh, on a planet, it, does it always go to RNA or are there other things that could work? And we don't completely know the answer to that, but it's something that can, you can test, right? You can make different kinds of hereditary molecules and you can see 
what works and what doesn't. And so I think eventually we'll have a much more complete answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, if you don't mind, when you ask your question, would you please also state your name and school or organization? Uh, uh, my name is Marcus Boman, and I'm here from Ova Gymnasium. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is uh, August Henneskjena Jonsson, and I'm here from uh, Victor Rydberg Odenplans Gymnasium. Am I allowed to ask two questions? I'll, le I'll let you. Thank you. <laughs> In that case, my first question is for Professor Johansson. Uh, if we were to leave Earth, do you believe that would in any way t safeguard us from extinction in any way? Is, is, is it if we would leave Earth. If yep. we were to terraform other planets or just colonialize other planets. Would it save us from extinction? <laughs> could it? Well, you know, astronauts who spend some time in space undergo considerable changes biologically, physiologically. And uh, when we think of, of going to planets like Mars, where there really is no atmosphere to support us, um, and very different conditions, um, I don't think we will last very long on planets like this. I think that it'll be a, a very short-lived escape, uh, and it, it's incredibly difficult for us to find another one of these Goldilocks pan planets that is not too hot and not too cold and not too close to the sun and not too far from the sun of the right size with the right gravity etc there are lots of conditions that we're adapted to and since adaptation to new environments takes a very long period of time you would have to keep those populations alive for very long periods of time where there's you know you literally can't grow food you can't you don't have clean water etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I suspect that we could put a small colony on the moon, uh, which would be wonderful if we could put a, a, a telescope, like uh, these large telescopes that they're building. Imagine if you could put them onto the moon, what you could see. But uh, I don't think people would be able to live there and with that lower gravity and so on and the tremendous change in temperatures and to keep all of these machines running for very long periods of time. So I, I don't think it's necessarily something that's going to preserve our species. Uh, I think we are in control largely of that today, unless there's some asteroid out there <laughs> that's going to sneak up on us um, <laughs> and uh, destroy our lives as well as other lives on this planet. But I, I, I really think that it does not solve the problem. The problem is here on our planet where we have evolved, where this unique experiment uh, in the universe has taken place that has led to uh, arguably a, a species that is unique and special. Uh, and we need to solve our problems. And in order to assure the survival of sapiens, I believe we have to solve our problems at home and not look towards other places. And until the time, you know, that if there, if there is space travel that can really travel for hundreds of thousands of years and sustain itself, I don't know what will happen. I leave that really to the, those who write science fiction. Okay. I'm going to let you ask your second question, but our line's getting longer, so. Well, this is a pretty open question, actually. Uh, you mentioned, Professor Johansson, that we are not the end of evolution. Uh, so, pretty open question, what do you believe is next for us uh, in evolution? What will we become? What will be the next step in uh, our species? The, in terms will there of be a next step? Sorry? Yeah. What's yeah. our next step in terms of evolution? Well, as I said, I think that it takes isolation. Uh, I would hope that the species would become more introspective and uh, more considerate of our fellow uh, uh, species on this planet and look after ourselves, but we have a very myopic view of, uh, of the world because we live very short periods of time. We don't look at the consequences of what we do to the planet and it is uh, largely based in a Western capitalist society, I think, who are, are looking for monetary returns rather than looking for opportunities to improve our ways of life. Why do I live in a country where we don't have free health care? Richest country in the world, probably. We don't have health care. Our infrastructure is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. We know all the problems with uh, the United States. But um, 
that's going to take changes in the way that people appreciate the gift of being alive. As I, uh, I've stolen this from Richard Dawkins, you know, that uh, I would look at the audience and my students and say, you're the lucky ones, you're going to die. <laughs> and they don't quite understand that, but the reason they're going to die is because they were born. And as we know, in terms of genetic recombination, that it's, you know, it's infinite. Uh, the, the person sitting next to you uh, it is very, you, you'll never find someone who is absolutely identical to you. And this is an enormous gift that is given to us that we have to encourage the younger generation, as has been talked about here, not only in terms of discovery about the natural world, which is terribly important, the things and origins of life, how the solar system works, the origins of the solar system, and so forth and so on, but to gain an appreciation for this opportunity of actually being alive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello. <clears throat> Eric, physics teacher from Estonia. Uh, my question is for Professor Sostek and Professor Lane. The question is, uh, what are our biggest obstacles to create life in a test tube in a, labor in a laboratory right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, trying to create life in a test tube in the laboratory is what my lab is focused on, what we've been working on for the last 20 years. And at this point, I think the biggest problems are understanding the chemistry of copying the genetic information in a really simple way be before the, you know, without enzymes. Um, so there's been a lot of progress. A lot of the problems have been solved, but there are still many gaps in our knowledge. There are, there are a lot of questions about that chemistry that remain to be answered. But I think if we could do that kind of uh, replication of the genetic material, uh, we could put it within membrane vesicles that we already know how to grow and divide. So I, I think the, the, we have an overall understanding of the process, and, and I don't know how long it'll take to actually generate new living forms, but it, it could be within the next few years or at least few decades. Thank you. I think a, a lot uh, depends on where you draw a line across a continuum of, of kind of non-living to living states because something as complex as a bacterium is, you know, if you, if you were to say to anyone in this audience what's the simplest form of life, you'd probably say a bacterium, but you could say a virus, you could say, you know, a retro element, a jumping gene or something. So a lot of the, you know, the, the kind of proto-cell that, that Jack is talking about, it's questionable whether that's alive, but it's alive if it's able to replicate itself, if it's able to pass on that information, if it's able to make copies of itself, then regardless of it's much simpler than a bacterium, it's doing what a living cell does and needs to do to evolve. So I think that would be a point, a point that we can aim to achieve in, in the laboratory. I think nobody would think that we can, we can start with a bunch of chemicals and get a bacterium growing out of it. That's, you know, that's, so, so there's a kind of a question of definition of what, what, what life is really there. But I think the idea that we can come up with, with protocells that grow and reproduce themselves and copy some, some basic uh, genetic instructions, that's an achievable goal. And yes, it's something that could happen. Certainly, I would hope within my lifetime. I don't know about three years, but I, you know, it's, 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 it, that's why we're doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hello. My name is Matt Skard from Orve Gymnasium. And this is a question from Donald Johansson. Uh, you know, since Lucy, our brain has gotten bigger. And I wonder for the chimpanzee, if they their brains have gotten bigger, or how have they changed? So, so he's saying that our brains have gotten bigger our since what? our brains have gotten bigger since Lucy, and um, he's asking about chimpanzees. Have their brains gotten bigger as well? Well, the problem with that is that we don't have any fossil chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, when one looks at the Miocene geological uh, period when we really did live on the planet of apes because in Africa there were maybe a dozen different genera and many different species. There were apes living in Europe. There were apes living all over Asia. 
Um, so there was a, a great diversity of apes. And if one looks at those apes, they all look like apes. Uh, they look like modern apes. So, of course, there, there, there are certain anatomical changes one sees in their locomotor systems. For example, uh, contemporary chimps and gorillas in Africa walk on their knuckles, okay, like that. Um, and there are a whole series of adaptations in the wrist and in the flexor muscles. But if we look at the ones in the Miocene, they weren't. They were just grasping organs. They weren't living on the ground. They were really all arboreal. But knuckle walking became one option that we see in the African apes. So there has been some change. But the, the overall, for instance, characterization of an ape is that it has, uh, and we are, either the naked ape or the bipedal ape or whatever. Uh, we don't have tails. Apes don't have tails. Um, the, the picture I showed you of early humans with a very projecting face, that reminds us of our ape-like ancestry that looked like all the apes that were living, okay? Um, so it tells us that they have not changed as much anatomically as we have changed, okay? But there are other things to consider which we cannot find in the fossil record, like behavior. Uh, behavior doesn't fossilize. The earliest really good indication of behavior is when the first stone tools appeared that were purposefully made, which now go back questionably to 3 million years, but certainly to 2.8 million years. You'd, someone sat down and deliberately flaked a rock and, and that is an innovation that is obviously associated with brain development and has implications in terms of the kinds of foods that that individual, that species would eat because all of a sudden you have a very high source of energy food, uh, which is uh, meat. Um, and that, in, that provides a sort of energy that can nourish the hungriest organ in our body, which is our brains. If, if we look at our closest living relatives, yes, chimps will from time to time eat meat. And they will actually, you know, they'll hunt but with their brawn, with their strength, not with artifacts that they make. Um, so overall, they were vegetarians. Uh, but things like social behavior uh, don't fossilize. Uh, and there are two different species of chimpanzees that live in Africa. One is uh, Pan troglodytes, which is the characteristic species you see if you uh, know the work of Jane Goodall. Um, and there is another kind called Pan paniscus, which was found in the 1930s. Uh, and it is found isolated in the Congo, which is, as I said, one of the major conditions for speciation. There's a major river separating them from breeding with the other species. And in those societies, their, their, their social behavior is completely different. In the normal pan troglodytes ape, which we think of as the chimpanzee, uh, are male dominated. And uh, they, uh, the males are in charge. Uh, in Paniscus, what sometimes mistakenly is called the pygmy chimpanzee, or the bonobo, um, it is, it is a, a matriarchal society in which the females are in charge. And uh, is an interesting society in terms of looking at, at our heritage because of the levels of aggression. You know, we have, if we look at, and, and I'm not saying that we are the most aggressive species, but I'm saying that males are the most ex antagonistic part of being human. Okay, so Whenever you read... As a female who's going to be aggressive right now, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cut you off, but I have a long line oh, okay. um, and not too well, much... So I'm saying that, yes, I'm sure apes have changed, but we don't know how much. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So, um, How's that? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, with the line that we have now, um, that will be it. And we're going to try to go through your questions as quickly as possible to get all of you before we break for lunch, okay? So please go ahead and identify yourself. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Aira Payari from Obo Academy University, Finland. And thank you all for your amazing speeches today. And I have a more general scientific question. 
So how do you as scientists approach uh, the rise in science skepticism in our modern society? And how can we as young scientists convince people and decision makers that scientific research is actually real? Well, maybe I can answer that because I try to do this in writing books. Um, and it's a very difficult thing um, because I, I think it, it looks bad when scientists argue among themselves to the, to, to the outer world. But scientists always argue among themselves. There isn't a, you know, a unified viewpoint. And, and, and what science can do is explore that, test ideas, and eventually we come to something like a unified view. It ends up in a textbook and science has moved forward. But the process of science, the thing that makes people excited about it and want to take part in it is the process of discovery. And um, almost by definition, discovering things is, is exciting and unknown, and you don't know what weight to put on them. Uh, and I think for people to come into science, that again is what people dream about when, when well, certainly when I was a kid, it's what, it's, and, and there's a danger of that being lost, of being kind of managed away by having very, a managerial approach to big science these days. Uh, this excitement of discovery, I think, is what draws people in, but also what leads to, to disagreements. And so in terms of trying to get that across to the general public, um, it's really quite subtle. It's a case of saying, well, we don't, know any, we don't know everything. There's a lot we don't know. But what we do think we know and we agree about you know, is, is fairly solid. And here's how we know. And that's, I suppose, what I try and do in the books, in my books, is, is give a sense of how do we come to know these things and where are the sources of disagreement and what kind of you know, concepts or experiments will help to settle this one way or the other. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> but anyway, if you think about it, doubt is a way of validating science. So. Yes, yes. I think we have, to, we have to get across to the public better than we do at the moment that science is not some kind of dry, dusty book of facts. It's a process of discovery, and it's exciting. And, and we, we, you know, over time, over decades, we, we do advance. And we have three great examples right here. <laughs> so thank you so much for your question. Yes, thank you. Please. Uh, so I'm... Aina Kjoti from English School, and uh, my question is, since the world's population is expected to be at around 11 billion at the end of the century, do you think we can produce enough resources sustainably to provide for so many people? Who wants to take that? <laughs> um, can we provide for 11 billion people? Can we provide for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I mean, uh, th someone has come up with this figure that we can support 11 billion people, but I'm not exactly sure how they came up with that figure. And when we see the loss of land for farming and growing things, can we make enough? People say, well, we'll make artificial food. You mean you can make enough artificial food to feed 11 billion people? How do you even get it to them? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. You could also say, well, even if we can do it, at what cost? At what cost to the natural world? Yeah. And at what cost to us? Mm. Yeah. I mean, would, would, uh, you want to live, you want to experience the human experience. You don't want to be, what was it, Soylent and, Soylent and Green, Green or whatever that they were <laughs> drinking. You want to live in a world that is full of reward, not go back to a survival-oriented world. Yeah, I'm sure we can do it in principle, but I think we have to change our behavior along the lines that Donald has been talking yeah. about in, in, in a dramatic way. So although, although, yes, I'm sure we can develop farming sufficiently to do it, we will destroy a lot of the natural world in doing it. And if we continue to be so selfish and egocentric and careless of the natural world, then I think it's far more likely it will end in war. Well, it's going to require a great economic evolution, not just biological yes. evolution. But go ahead. Hello, my name is Ylva Lorenson, and I come from Don Donner Gymnasiet in Gothenburg. And I have actually a question for you, Mr. Shostak, about your work on telomerase and telomeres, um, if that is okay. Of course. <laughs> um, well, telomeres um, protect the chromosomes in our cells, but in many bacteria there are additional DNA molecules, the plasmids. Um, so I was wondering, how are these DNA molecules protected from degrading? And does telomerase have a key role in, in that as well? So, 
it's really interesting that in, in most, not all, but most uh, bacteria and archaea, the DNA chromosomes are circles and the plastid chromosomes are circles. So there are no DNA ends and there are no telomeres. A question that is still unanswered is what really drove the evolution of linear chromosomes that needed telomeres and telomerase in order to, to survive and to replicate? Uh, that that it remains an open question. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> next please. <laughs> Hello, my name is Annabelle Jerry from Don Gymnasiet in Gothenburg. And I'm wondering to all of you, do you think we can create a society which gives us the modern comforts such as, you know, not dying from a cold, um, and which considers our nature and nature around us? And if so, what do you think that society would look like? <coughs> Sorry, what? Do, you, do you mind uh, repeating yeah. the question a little bit? I'd say. I have a hard yeah. time hearing yeah. though. Uh, do you think we can create a society which gives us the modern comforts of not dying from a cold, for example, um, and which considers our nature and the nature around us? And what do you think that will look like? Can we create a society where we're, we're not dying from cold, but we're not killing the natural world? I yeah, think exactly. That's what I understood. Yes, I think we can. I, I think we have to put our mind to it. I think we have to care about these things, and I find it very heartening uh, that you know we've we've had big uh, marches in London from you know my kids in school were out on 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 strike about the environment. I think that the, the the younger generations care about these questions in a way that um, my generation probably didn't enough. Uh, certainly when, when, when I was younger, it wasn't a question in the way that it is now. I think there's now a, a feeling that if we don't act now and get it right, then it will go wrong. Yes, I think technology can solve a lot of those problems, but we have to change ourselves from within. Yeah. Then we're back to <coughs> Donald's problem that we, you know, natural selection isn't as fast as cultural selection. We have to change the culture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Ali, and I attend Telia Nosset in Soda Telia. Uh, may I ask two interconnected questions for Mr. Johansson? Yes. All right. So the first question is, can we observe fossils of animals evolving to other animals besides the human genus? So can we see a fish evolving into a lizard and a lizard into a bird, for example? And the second question is, if humans do go in extinct, would other animals be able to evolve at the rate that we did? And would it be the modern primates that do that first, since they are, they're the closest relatives to us? Thank you. Well, we observe those things through the fossil record. Uh, we know that there are creatures that lived in the ocean that they used their fins for pushing themselves along the bottom of the ocean. And when they came out on land, uh, and you see this in, in some fish, that they have the ability, different fish have an ability to speak, to, to use oxygen, and they don't have to live in water. So you can see these changes over a long time. We don't see them so obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, except when we look at things like at the bacterial level. Uh, if you look at the way uh, bacteria is evolving today because of antibiotics. That's a very rapid evolution. It's not a natural evolution. Uh, it is something that we're imposing on them. And if you have a particular bacterium that's bad and uh, it's causing disease and you develop an antibiotic, you kill that off, but there's always something out at the end where there are a few that are resistant and they become the founder population of the next bell curve. So we're pushing under uh, domestic domestication uh, uh, the evolution in bacteria. And I, I don't know how you define a species in bacteria. You don't. You don't. <laughs> uh, but you would call those different species probably based on the particular behavior uh, with, with respect to antibiotics. Uh, and what was the second question? Uh, well, if humans went extinct, would other animals be able to evolve the way we did and basically yeah. dominate the Earth as we do? And would it be the modern primates that do that before any, any yeah. other animal? You know, it's very interesting if you, if you look at our evolution and you look back to the beginning, it looks like a straight line, okay? But if you look at, at the start 
of the apes that began to act differently. There were so many ways along the way, so many branches. If you took the wrong branch, you went extinct. It's like looking at a river. If you start with the Nile and you want to get to the Mediterranean, you just go downstream, downstream, downstream. But if you start at one of those tributaries and try to get to the origin of it, if you take the wrong turn, you go somewhere else. So, um, I, I, and I don't think that we would see humans evolve again on the planet. Okay. Which would be a great tragedy for, yeah. for, for us. For us. <laughs> <laughs> or would it Thank be? You. Not for the planet, Thank but you for us. us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sofia Nadim and I'm from Westminster Gymnasium, Gothenburg. I have a question from Nick Lane. I want to ask you about LUCA, the Universal Common Ancestor. And I don't mean with right or wrong something, but I want to know how many percent is truth behind this uh, LUCA, and wh how, you, how you get it inspired for your work. The, the truth about LUCA, Yes. Uh, well, there probably isn't a truth about LUCA. I mean, LUCA is a construction from trying to compare genes from all known living things and we get back to a cell. Well, it's not a cell, it's a population of cells. And that's the last universal common ancestor is what LUCA stands for. Um, uh, and, you know, it depends on which genes you choose and how you compare them. And genes also in bacteria will move around by lateral gene transfer. This is how they can become so resistant so quickly to a, a lot of antibiotics and so on. So the fact that you see a gene in this group of bacteria in E. coli doesn't mean to say it evolved with E. coli. It could have come from almost anywhere else. So you go back and you try and trace a vertical tree through something which is actually a swamp of lateral movement of genes. And, and so the people who try to do this come up with answers between, let's say, 60 genes and 3,000 genes. Um, and there's no agreement about what it was or the environment, really, that it was in, because it depends on which genes you chose. Theoretically, it has to exist, but we shouldn't think of it as one cell. We should think of it anyway as a population. And there's no reason either to assume that uh, you know, fr from my point of view, I would like to try to track back LUCA and say, well, what are the properties of LUCA that allow us to go back towards the origin of life? Now, it's possible that there are some. It's also possible that this is just a bad reconstruction and there aren't any. It's possible, as I think Jack has said on, on other occasions, perhaps LUCA was after an impact and was the survivor of that impact. And, and you know, you go back another 500 million years before that and there's the true common ancestor. So... You know, we don't know, but you can, you can make a hypothesis and you can think about the consequences. So from my point of view, you can take certain genes, try and reconstruct what I think or what some people think Luca might have looked like and say, well, does this say anything about an environment? Does it, do, can we draw a straight line? It doesn't have to be the line could go like this, but it could be a straight line. What might it tell us? Does it suggest some experiments? So it's very, very equivocal. I think it's worth trying. I think we learn things that way. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to kind of say anything with any certainty based on that as a way of thinking. But uh, you know, I think as a way of thinking, it helps you to come up with hypotheses that you can try and test, and that might give some firmness to it in the end. Thank you. Yeah, man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please. Uh, I'm Jenny Johansson from Henderson's Gymnasium, and I have a question for Mr. Johansson. Uh, when you realized that Lucy was a new species, did that change your view on human evolution? And if it did, how did it change? Okay, if, when you realized that Lucy was a new species, did it change your view on human evolution? And if so, how? I, I didn't get the question. Uh, when you said that Lucy was a new species, did it change your view of human evolution? Did it? Ch yes, it drastically changed my uh, view of human evolution. Uh, and that was where the controversy came. Um, we were talking about how scientists uh, established hypotheses and for various reasons battle for their own, whether it's based on the evidence or on emotion. And uh, the discovery of Lucy allowed us, her species, Afarensis, allowed us to catch a glimpse of a generalized ancestor we had never had before. Up to that point, and, and what that did was it cast a new light on the... Other fossils, like the fossils that were first found in the 1920s in southern Africa, Australopithecus africanus, it put it off the line. 
And when I announced this redrawing of the tree and putting Afarensis as the common ancestor um, in May of 1978, um, it, it began to change the whole geometry of the, of the tree. And uh, it, it significantly changed our uh, views of that hypothesis of what's, how species were related to one another. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, please. And I noticed some, there's somebody sneaking in the end of the line. We're going to do our best to do all the questions, but we don't have that much time. So we'll, we'll try. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Victoria Lonstedt from Cathedral School in Uppsala. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Johansson. You named three unique characteristics of human beings. And I'm wondering, why did only humans evolve in this way? Why did none of the other species living uh, in the same environment, essentially, as ours, uh, evolve any of these characteristics? Why there were different species? And why didn't other species... Go ahead. Say it. Why didn't other species also evolve the characteristics that make us so different? Well, there were other species that evolved. Um, Afarensis was a generalized species. It, it did not have the specializations of many of the descendants. There was a very important um, environmental change at about three million years. It was a cooling and a drying going on in Africa. Uh, back in 10 million years, five million years before that, you had tropical rainforests that went all the way from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. And I, the early, earliest uh, hominins or hominids that we see were probably more forested creatures. And when the forests began to disappear in the east, some of them followed the forest, those were the apes, and others now had to face life in a very new environment under very different selective pressures. And some of them, they don't decide this, but some of them took the route of specializing in a highly vegetarian diet. Uh, and that brought about a whole series of anatomical changes in the teeth and the jaws and the skull and the muscles that power our chewing system. Another group began, and I'm not saying that there are only two groups, but another response to that environmental change was that they began probably to scavenge um, carnivore kills. And they weren't, at that point, equipped to actually eat the meat because we no longer had big piercing canines and we didn't have tools. And um, tools began gradually to be made. We don't know what that initial genius moment was. It could have been as simple as we look at chimps in West Africa that have uh, bodongo nuts that, that you cannot crack these open unless you use a big rock and hit that. And it may be as simple as a piece of stone coming off and cutting their finger in an aha moment. But that allowed them to access a new kind of meat which had huge implications for social behavior, huge implications for the, the evolution of the brain, uh, and so on. So there were the descendants diversified at least into three lineages, as I saw, as I suggested, but there probably were other lineages. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Solomon, and I'm a chemistry teacher from the International School of the Gothenburg region. And I have an open question to the panel, uh, but maybe more directed to uh, Dr. Johansson, but I would appreciate input. So my question is about, um, this arose from uh, two recent books written by an Israeli historian by the name of Yuval Noah Harari. And the first one was Sapiens, where he captures the last 70,000 years. Uh, and then the, the second one was Homo Deus, so the rise of this new species uh, with uh, sort of godlike supernatural features. That would be, and the evolution of this would be accelerated or brought about by the combination of two things. So genetic engineering and all the things we can do nowadays with CRISPR and whatnot, which d undoubtedly accelerates evolution or the rate of it, and also artificial intelligence, which is something that I was hoping to bring to the discussion. So the combination of these two factors, coupled with the fact that there's a scarcity of resources on the planet, according to Dr. Harari, might lead to a situation where billions of people, sapiens as we know it, might become redundant or useless. 
and therefore might be outcompeted by this new homo deus. And I would appreciate any uh, thoughts or reflections on, in this regard. Redundancy. <laughs> We're worried about redundancy. Uh, I haven't read Homo Deus. I did read Sapiens and I did read his 21 lessons for the 21st century. Um, and I, I, I find, I mean, he, he's, a, he's a very clear thinker. Uh, I tend to find when I know more about a subject, I disagree with him more. Um, <laughs> no. I, I found his book, 21st Century, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, quite depressing because I think from a biochemical point of view, Talking about algorithms and so on, and, 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 and machine learning allowing to, uh, you know the computers and algorithms to predict our own behaviour better than we're able to do so ourselves, and I found that quite depressing. But I didn't see a good strong argument against it. So I was ironically almost relieved to read a piece in the newspaper about um, a, a computer virus that had been introduced into a British hospital, which simulated um, brain tumours. And it was capable of imposing a brain tumor on a scan that didn't have one and fooling doctors or removing one that was there. And again, oh. fooling a, a small oh. committee of doctors. And, and this was done without malicious intent just to show that it was possible to crack through the firewalls. And it, it struck me, the reason I, 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 I say this is, well, he didn't talk about malicious viruses, computer viruses, as a way of making algorithms imperfect. <laughs> So I think there's always going to be a limit to how much we can rely on algorithms because there's, there's viruses that hack them too. And I, I find that hopeful that perhaps we're still going to depend on human judgment and if that's the case, then perhaps there isn't going to be so many redundant people. But also creativ <laughs> like human creativity. Well, he argues that you know, music, music and so on, uh, computers will get better, algorithms will get better at composing music than human composers. I don't like the idea, but I can't say he's wrong. But I, I, I just like the idea that computer viruses may spoil all of that yep. vision of the future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm, my name is Hugo Save from Sundsvalls, from Sundsvall. And um, I have a biochemistry question to Professor Storstak and Professor Lane. And um, one of the foundations of life is the reproduction. Um, when I think of molecules that can reproduce themselves, I think of RNA. But is RNA is still a very complex molecule. So I wonder, like, what's the most primitive molecule that can catalyze its own synthesis and create copies of itself? And yeah, the most primitive molecule that might lay the foundation of life and like the reproducing. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to distinguish between. Um, uh, molecules that can copy themselves in, uh, in the wide variety of autocatalytic reactions. Mm -hmm. But what's important for life is a molecule that can encode information and how that can copy itself. And so far, we haven't found anything simpler than RNA that can do that. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that uh, you know people have synthesized the building blocks of RNA under prebiotic conditions, have joined them together to, to make stretches of RNA, mm. and have demonstrated that they can copy themselves. We might quibble about whether these environments are the right environment or the starting point, the right one, but you know conceptually, it's all been done. Uh, it can be done, and it, it demonstrates that you know RNA is not such a complex molecule that it cannot be synthesized from scratch under reasonably prebiotic conditions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Patrick Johansson from Huddinge uh, Gymnasiet. Thank you for your all presentations. Uh, I appreciate it. But uh, since you all talk about the origin of life, I want to rather ask, what do you believe will happen if we, for instance, move to to Mars and then uh, <clears throat> never gets back uh, to Earth. What do you believe will affect uh, your uh, specific studies areas? <clears throat> if I was clear enough. If we find life on Mars, how would it affect? No, uh, I mean like if we move to Mars instead, we oh. uh, like uh, <laughs> take away Earth. Like how do you think will affect the, your specific area in what you research? <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So, if we move to Mars, how, if we will, move to how, Mars, how will that affect your research, research? Your areas of research? Our research? <laughs> yeah. In your specific area. 
Well, I'm going to stay in my lab on this earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. I mean, I think it would only affect our research if we found things on Mars that were completely unexpected for what we, what we think we know. Uh, I mean, most of what we've found out about Mars so far, in some ways, echoes what we know about the Earth. And in, in that sense, uh, it's, it's perceived as one of the places where we might hope to find life or might hope to find evidence that life had existed previously. If, you know, an H.G. Wells vision of Mars would completely change everything I thought about life here, uh, but it's unlikely to happen. Do you think, like, um, uh, that uh, people will become more ignorant in uh, researching in uh, your specific areas and uh, discoveries about the origin of life and humans? Uh, That's I, I more don't see point. why it would affect it very much. Yeah. Okay. But I think I'm done. Thank you all. I think these Thank are human questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, my name is Isaac Johansson, and I'm from Touraine Innovation School in Lund. And I have a question for, well, any or all of you. And that is, is it plausible for a uh, silicon-based life form to exist based on its... Uh, it's, it's very much alike the carbon atom. And if so, is it possible for it to grow as intelligent and as complex as a human being? Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, there is quite an elaborate and complex silicon uh, chemistry, but it's tiny uh, compared to what you can do with carbon chemistry. So personally, uh, I mean, I, I can't rule it out, and maybe uh, clever chemists could make a form of life that's based on, on silicon chemistry, but I, I would be extremely skeptical that silicon-based life could evolve naturally somewhere. I, I would agree with that. I mean, it, uh, carbon is actually more common than silicon. It does, it does perhaps slightly similar chemistry, but it does it much better. You have a wealth of molecules that silicon just can't produce. And it comes in, in, in kind of handy Lego bricks like CO2, for example, or, or cyanide or whatever it might be, but it's a single carbon atom there, uh, whereas you know, the most common form of silicon is, is, is silicon oxides, which are sand, uh, and, and they're enormous structures. You can't build on sand or with sand. Uh, you can do it as, uh, you know, as intelligent design and make <laughs> chips, but to bootstrap yourself up from an inorganic planet into life, I think you need the building blocks that you can pluck out of the air and turn them into something structured, and I don't think you could do that with silicon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few more questions and very little time, so I'm going to ask that you keep your answers brief, and then we'll go to lunch and you'll be able to continue your discussions uh, amongst yourselves and possibly with the speakers. So please go ahead. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kevin Larsson from Turin Innovation School. My uh, question is, if a human would be, if a human was on, uh, uh, on Mars, would they be able to completely change their physiology to be able to live on Mars without any help or, or their biological restrictions which would, which would make it impossible for them to change? For example, uh, the change gravity, would they... I, I don't think there's any way we could live without oxygen, so we'd have to change Mars. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. But for example, uh, would there, are there any uh, biological processes would, which wouldn't be able to function on a low gravity or on Mars? I mean. uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, I think the lower gravity of Mars is the least of its problems. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's the availability of... Uh, of water and oxygen that we need. And to adapt to that by changing our physiology, I think is almost impossible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Johan Johansson Lundqvist and um, I'm from the French school in Stockholm. Um, I was originally gonna pose this question to Dr. Johannes, uh, Johansson, but uh, since you've gotten so many questions, I'll pose to the others. Um, uh, what can we expect to learn um, regarding the origin of life on Earth uh, by studying uh, potential life forms on other planets? Okay. Um, 
I think we, you know, we'll never know how life started on Earth. We, you know, we don't have a time machine, we can't do that. Even if we did, where would you go? We can't agree among ourselves about the most likely environment, and it's a continuum, so we don't know which lines would have gone where and which ones wouldn't. What I think we can understand is, the, the, in principle, what are the steps that are required? What kind of environments can lead to the conditions that would lead to uh, the emergence of cell-like structures and, 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 and growth. And that, I think, we can apply principles to. Um, we, we can think through, and we don't, you know, we don't know the answers. That's what science is for. We can, we, can, we can think, well, these principles seem to lead this direction. We can test that. We can see if it's true. Perhaps it merges with this line of thinking. Um, and I, I, if we are able to understand a set of principles that would lead to the emergence of life, then the question is, well, is it, an, is it a narrow and restricted set of principles that would tend to mean that life elsewhere would be rather Earth-like? I would say it would be carbon-based and cell-based, um, but I, it would be surprising if it had something like DNA, but it would almost certainly be a molecule similar to DNA. Or is it much, is it much broader? Are, are the principles quite flexible and allow different you know, radically different types of life, silicon-based life forms. For, for, you know, I've just said I don't think we're going to see it, but maybe I'm just wrong. Uh, so I think we can, when, when we understand the principles that gave rise to life on Earth, we can then apply them elsewhere, uh, and I think they will be meaningful. Can Thank I, you. Can I just yeah. add yes, something go, to that? Go ahead. I think there's one really fundamentally important thing about the possibility of detecting an independent origin of life. So far, we only have one example of life, right? That means the origin of life could have been incredibly rare and difficult. We don't know. If we see another example of life, yeah. it means it's not that hard for life right. to get started. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentations. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Lothar, and I'm from Victor Rydbe Gymnasium. And uh, Professor Jorensen, you read your book, but to Professor Sostak and Professor Lane, how did you choose your specific uh, scientific research? Was it a pure co coincidence or did you know what to research <laughs> when you were like our age? <laughs> go ahead. I, I always knew that I was interested in science and wanted to do research, but I've worked on lots of different things uh, throughout my life. Um, um, so it's always just been a matter of finding problems that I thought were interesting and that could be approached. And you know, there are many, many interesting problems to to solve. So it's it's been a sort of winding path from one interesting problem to another. Nick, do you want to? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I had a very winding path, uh, which I'm not sure I could recommend to anybody, but. Um, <laughs> In some way, I, I've been working on energy for a long time. Right? So my, my own PhD was to do with organ transplantation and the function of mitochondria in transplanted organs when you strip the oxygen away and then reintroduce it. And one thing I find wonderful about science is that trying to understand what's going on in the mitochondria of transplanted kidneys, also, if you swing around on that, raises questions about why does it work that way, how did it begin, how did it evolve. You know, now I feel privileged to be asking questions about the origin of life that come from a question you know, 30 years ago about, or 20, 30, I don't remember, uh, about, about kidney function. It's a wonderful thing about science is, 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 is the viewpoint can shift from almost you know, dancing on a pinhead. Uh, and so I think a lot of people find their path uh, they don't find it immediately, or, or they follow a wandering path. And I think we need to keep that open for people in science, so your ability to find your way without, without having kind of blinkers on from the beginning. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead, please. Right. Um, my name is Anna Olberg. I'm from Katedralskolan in Uppsala, and I have a question for Professor Schustak. Um, concerning ATP, uh, based on the structural similarities between ATP and RNA, is it reasonable to assume that ATP um, sprung from RNA? And if that's the case, how did that happen? And could there have been a form of life in which there was RNA but not ATP? Uh, let's see. So, so it turns out, uh, in, by looking at some of the prebiotic chemical pathways, ATP is actually quite easy to make. Uh, so the building blocks that go to uh, uh, join together to make RNA molecules, you know, one, one of them is, is, is 
A or mm -hmm. B A M P, but making ATP is pretty pretty easy. Uh, whether its first functions were actually involved in, in uh, energy, I think is still a, an open question. There are some recent ideas about other things that ATP uh, might have done. Uh, but I, I think it was, it was around early on and, and became used uh, for, for multiple purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so my name is Matthias Acke. I come from Katedralskolan in Lund. Um, and so my question is for everybody. There seems to be something hindering intelligent life forms on other planets, on exoplanets. Um, and so do you believe that this is because of that, uh, the complexity of forming uh, competitive molecules like uh, Schutzgat, uh, like you discussed, or do you believe that uh, it is the um, formation of more complex life forms? Or do you even believe that maybe there is an immense diversity of complex life forms, but simply none of them has started to ask the question of what is beyond our planet? Uh, I think the first thing is we have no idea what's out there on exoplanets. We, you know, we, we don't really yet. We can just about detect the atmospheric composition of some of them. Uh, and and it, it's very difficult even um, to, to, to prove that there's life on Earth from the edges, outer edges of the solar system. It, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, I think about these questions. Uh, it seems to me that the origin of complex life on Earth, it happened only once. There's some degree of improbability about it, but I can't put a number on how improbable it is. Um, all I would say is the origin of life, again, we can't put a number on it, but then there's a two billion year gap where it's just bacteria. And it seems to me that it could easily be that we find bacteria everywhere uh, and that complex life is more uncommon. It may be that that hurdle is, is difficult, but is crossed in you know, millions of different exoplanets. I, I don't think we can say, we can just look. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, you're the bonus question, right? Because it <laughs> must be important if you snuck in after uh, <laughs> the line was closed. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Salman Ansala, and I'm from Free School in Uppsala. Uh, and, I, uh, and you've already expressed your doubts about uh, Earth being able to house 11 billion humans. And I was wondering, how could humans uh, abstain from uh, reproduction uh, in the future? in order not to reach the, that limit. One word or two word answer to that is educate women. This is, seems to be, you know, family size shrinks all across the word, world. This is, uh, Hans Rosling has really brought this uh, to, to the forefront. Uh, family size shrinks all by itself as, as, soon as, as, as soon as women become more educated. This is, <laughs> it answers itself. <laughs> All right, may I ask one more question, please? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you might be trouble, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, I've got a hypothetical question for Professor Shostak. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, if the Earth's magnetic field were to suddenly disappear, w w how would water-based creatures be affected? So I didn't quite I, I didn't hear you. Question. It's difficult to hear sometimes okay. with the microphone, but go ahead. Try if try if the Earth's magnetic field were to suddenly disappear, ah. uh, how would that affect water-based creatures? So if, if, our, if the Earth's magnetic field disappeared, uh, the solar wind would, would be hitting the atmosphere, and over a period of millions of years, we would progressively lose... Uh, the atmosphere. Whether we could technologically do anything about it is an interesting uh, uh, question to think about. I don't know. Okay, so I want to thank all of you and thank all of the participants for this wonderful morning session.